Morning. Morning. Hey, you guys give the worship team another hand. Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> you did a great job. Like I said, I'm just constantly amazed at the talent God keeps sending us. And some of you right now, you're sitting out there, and you play something or sing, and, and you're just sitting there, and you need to be a part of that. So make sure you track down JT, check on your connection card here that you would like to serve, and we'll figure out how to do that. I want to go over something real quick that maybe some of you didn't know. Uh, last week, we got a bunch of connection cards in, and we thank you so much for doing that. The problem is, you didn't keep your part. You just, you just fold the whole thing up and stuck it in the bucket, which is fantastic. We're thankful for that. But this part is for you, okay? It just, it's perforated right down the middle, has a place on there for notes or drawings. Like I said last week, if you get bored with what I'm talking to you about, uh, take this part home with you. Leave this part in the bucket for us. That's what we need you to do. Also, as you leave today, or maybe some of you came in this morning, any of you get one of these cards that says Christmas Paradox on it when you came in? No? Okay, well, we've got some in the back, and as you leave, make sure you ask for them. These are invite cards to invite people up to the next couple weeks till our Christmas series ends here at Real Life Church. We want to make sure that we're giving you the resource to say, hey, come check out what's happening at Real Life Church, okay? Uh, this series, as you look around, you notice that we've got some Christmas trees, and they're hanging upside down, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, we didn't realize it made as much sense until we Googled it, and, and this is actually a thing. People do this in their house. They hang their Christmas trees upside down. And um, we really did it to try to make a point that uh, Christmas has kind of been flipped upside down in our culture. And so we're going to be talking about that over the next few weeks. Today, we're going to be talking more about maybe the personal paradoxes in mind in your life that we struggle with. Next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the paradox of how we live in a Christian nation, or what's been proposed as a Christian nation and historically has been known in a Christian as a Christian nation, but also as Christians, we have the least amount of ability to say what it is that we believe. It's hard for us to be bold, as Scripture tells us, to be bold without being either, and I don't want to use the word persecuted, because actually, guys, here in America, we got it pretty easy. I mean, it's pretty cake for us as Christians. Even though it's getting worse, it's still not as bad as it is in most other countries in the world. And so next week, we're going to be talking about this reality of what's truly happening on why... I mean, you guys have seen it, right? Over the last month or two months, the, the whole nativity scene on the courthouse square has been in the newspapers. And we're going to talk about why that matters to us as Christians. Why, why? And you say, oh, no, Pastor Vince is going to get on his political soapbox. And I want to make sure that you understand my heart first and foremost. See, what I believe is that as Christians, there's a reason God gives us the word of God. And there's also commands in there that say, you must be bold. But it seems like every time we as Christians step across the line to be bold, we're told, no, 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 no. You can't do that because you're going to offend somebody. If you offend somebody, that's the ultimate sin. And I want to just tell you, do you know how I experienced Jesus Christ for the first time? It was because someone told me, Vince, you're a sinner. And I didn't like that. I didn't like the idea that somebody thought that they could call me out or say something about me until what I realized they were saying was true. And then I needed a Jesus to come and save me. And so it took an offense to really get me to see the light. Uh, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Anybody just ever been completely blunt, straightforward, truthful with you, and it hurts a little bit, like a gut punch? But then after they get done, you go, I needed that. I needed that. Well, that's kind of where we're going to be next week. We're going to talk about the exclusivity of Christianity, where there is only one way. There's only one way to get to heaven, and it's only through one person whose name is Jesus. And there's really only one way to accept him, and that's by surrendering of your own heart and accepting his will into your life. And some people, we live in, like I said, we live in a day and age where they go, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about next week. So I challenge you, go invite everybody you know. We'll find room for them. We got extra chairs. We got some room in the wings over here. We'll make y'all love on each other a little bit more, and you can sit closer together, and, and we'll make room for them. But make sure you pick up a couple cards today and go invite your friends and neighbors. Maybe invite that coworker that you've been wanting to come. Maybe it's your parents or your kids. They've been looking for an excuse, and you can pull the whole, look, it's Christmas. It's got a tree on it. You should come to church and see if that works for you. But try to get them in the door as we talk about the Christmas paradox. Now, 
It's interesting when you use the word paradox, it's kind of like an oxymoron. The word oxymoron is take basically when something doesn't make sense with the other thing on it. You, you can say like jumbo shrimp is an oxymoron. Um, uh, awfully good is an oxymoron. Okay, and, and so you have those things, but a paradox is not just verbal, it's something that actually happens. Okay, like somebody told me this morning, they come up to me afterwards and they said, hey, we, we heard that you're, you're exercising and trying to eat better. And I said, yeah. They said, what about that paradox? It's eating season and you're eating better. And I said, yeah, that's, that's one of them right there. But we see them all the time in life, like I said, where we as Christians are told to be bold, but yet in the society we live in, it's getting harder and harder for us to do that. We see it in the Bible where Jesus, he came from the throne room of heaven to a barn to be born. That doesn't make much sense. It just doesn't seem to click logically. And so today I want to talk to you about some things. And here's the thing I want to share. This is going to be our theme verse for today and possibly the next three weeks. But for today, it's this verse. It's found in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It says this, for nothing will be impossible with God. Now, I'm going to read that again. And when I finish it, that's a great place for a really big old amen, hoop and holler kind of thing. All right? I need you all to be with me this morning. So the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Okay. All right, good. Now you're with me. All right. And so if we believe this, and here's what I think you should do. You need to make this verse your new John 3.16. Most everybody knows John 3, 16, or we can rattle off part of it. We know for God so love the world part, and we may not know the details of the rest of it, but we know some portion of it. This is a short enough verse that you should have it memorized before you leave today. For nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. And you say, but Vince, why does that matter? Because, see, God is the great equalizer when it comes to paradoxes in our life. Because you and I will say things. I typically teach this when I do marriage counseling or any kind, of, any kind of counseling with a couple. And there's two words a married couple should never say to each other. And I just said one of them. Never. The other one is always. Because if you say that in communication with each other, you're going to probably start an argument. If you say something like, well, you never do this. Or you always do that. Okay. We believe some of those things in our life. We'll say things like, well, I'm just never going to get away from the situation that I'm in. I'm, I'm never going to be able to move beyond. You see, Vince, I, I, I've always had this addiction, and because I've always had this addiction, I'm never really going to be able to experience what real life is without it. And see, what happens when we live there is we begin to look at the people that don't have the stuff that we deal with, and we get bent at them. We get mad at them. We start going, you know what? I don't know, they must be cheating or doing something different than what I'm doing because it's just not fair that they've got all the success and I'm struggling to get by. It's just not fair that they're all healthy and stuff and I constantly deal with sickness. It's just not fair. And that's what happens when we end up living here, focusing on the stuff we don't have. Well, I want to go ahead and unpack some of that today for you as we're going to stay in the book of Luke here for the most part and we're going to talk about Mary. Okay, so here's the first thing I want you to understand as we dive into these paradoxes is this. Don't let your circumstances determine your destination. Right. Don't let where you are right now determine where you're going to end up. Because that's just really unfair to the God who created you. Could you imagine taking a toy that you had built or something maybe that you had built at your home or a toy that you're playing with, and then all of a sudden you went in and you started to play with it and you started to have this story in your head. And I don't know if you guys ever played with toys like I did growing up, but I, when I played with toys, I was full on. I mean, I had my G.I. Joes and, and I was having battles and all that good stuff, but I always had a story in mind. And never once... Never once did the toy look back at me and go, whoa, that's not what we're going to do. Today, I'm just hanging out by the pool, Vince, I'm not playing your game. But yet, we as the created being oftentimes look at the creator and say, God, I'm not doing it. I'm just not going to do it. I'm comfortable in my situation, in my circumstance, and this is just where I'm going to hang out. Here we have the story of Christmas where it begins, and we've got this angel Gabriel that shows up to Mary, and he says this in Luke chapter 1. He says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, 
favored woman. Now, husbands, I'm just going to tell you, be a good way to start your day right there. <laughs> Try that. Just look at her and say, greetings, favored woman. See how that goes for you. If she, if she gets mad that you called her woman, you may want to try something different. But uh, I, as I read this, I thought, how, how would I have responded? I mean, it would have been weird if he'd called me woman. But if, if Gabriel would have shown up in my house, greetings. I've got a message from you. And I'm sitting here, and I read the rest of it. And I don't want to go back to this favored woman part of it for a second because it says, greetings, favored woman. And if you notice, there's an exclamation point on the end. And that's because when angels showed up, they didn't whisper. <laughs> Nowhere in Scripture do we ever see an angel go, psst, hey. Never. When an angel shows up and speaks, there's some boldness behind it. He shows up with a message, and you need to hear what he's about to say. And so here Gabriel shows up, who is the messenger angel throughout Scripture. We have Gabriel with this message. At the end of days, he's going to send another message when he steps out and blows a horn, and it's about to get rowdy then. But he's, he's the messenger. And so he sends this message, greetings, favored woman. Mary looking around the room going, favored what? I'm, I'm somewhere between the ages of 14 and 17. Nobody knows my name. I'm not, I mean, we, we don't read anything in Scripture about her before this moment. And yet this angel shows up in my room and calls me favored. And the word favored there actually translates to the word accepted. He says, greeting you who are accepted by God. I've got a message for you. He continues on. The Lord is with you. Well, that's good to know. And the next verse is so funny because I love how honest the Bible is. The next verse says, and Mary, dazed and confused, <laughs> says this back to the angel. What manner of salutation is this? And if you put that in our current lingo, she said, what are you doing here? I don't understand what's happening. You've just kind of shown up in the room here. You've told me that I'm accepted and that God is with me, and that's fantastic. But are you here for good news or bad news? Because this is a little freaky what's happening to me right now. And the angel goes on and tells her and says, actually, let me lay this down for you. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you are going to conceive, and you are going to give birth to a child who shall be Christ the King. He will be the Messiah. He will wipe away the sins of the world. He's the one you've been waiting for. And Mary, it's you that gets to handle this responsibility. It's you that gets to carry this child for nine months. It's all on you. Now, let's just be honest. If that would have happened to any of us, we'd have probably went, can you go check with Susie next door? Because, <laughs> you know, I just don't know, I mean, really about all this stuff. See, Mary could have looked at her circumstances and said, you know, Gabriel, nobody knows who I am. If, I mean, if, if God is coming to the world through me, you probably should find somebody a little better off than me. I'm probably not the best choice. I mean, I, I don't have much. My, my family doesn't have much. They're, they're not even known. I, I'm, I'm actually a spouse to this guy named Joseph. And, and yes, he's, he's in the line of David. And, and, but, but really, Gabriel, it's, I'm, not, I'm not your girl. It's, it's really not me. I'm not the person that you need. Well, here's the thing that I think we oftentimes do as believers, and maybe you're here this morning, you're not a believer, but you do the same things too. We look so much at this moment in our life, the circumstances of right now, and we never look to what it could be because we're constantly focused on the junk that we're living through now. My marriage just can't be better because we're too focused on what's going wrong in it. My, my job, I just can't ever find a better job. Well, why not? Because the one I'm in stinks. What? Well, go find another one. Well, the one I'm in is just horrible. Well, quit griping about where you are and move. Thank you for preaching that for me. <laughs> go on. Take another step out here and see what God has before you. Here's the thing. Here's what Mary did, and this is the lesson that I hope you get in this first point because it is so vital for us to understand. In verse 38, Mary comes back and says this. I am the Lord's servant. I hope that everything that you said about me comes true. Let's do this. 
and the angel left. The one thing that she did was say, yes. And really, it's, it's not so much what she said, it's the action that she gave, and the action was surrender. She set herself aside and said, you know what? This obviously isn't about me anymore. Uh, there's something greater at play. There's something bigger happening. And this bigger thing that's happening, I need to make sure that I'm open to. So let me tell you this, church, and I, and I hope you get this and I hope you write this down, is that, that it's, it has very little to do with your situation, okay? Your surroundings aren't nearly as important as, important as your surrender is. Your surroundings may be awful, but if you're willing to surrender to God, he can change that. He, he can take your surroundings and make it something completely different. He's good at that. He's amazing at that. But you've got to be willing to let him do that. When, when God was calling me to preach, I kept saying, God, no, 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 no. I'm not going to preach. 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 And then I did what everybody else does. I blamed everybody else for why I couldn't do something. Y'all know anybody like this? Okay. If, if you just nodded quietly, then you understand what I'm talking. If you thought of somebody and wanted to call them out, you missed it. I say, God, I'm not going to preach because my wife doesn't want to be a pastor's wife. She just doesn't. I never asked her. I just, I just did. She just didn't want to. She doesn't want to be a pastor. God, come on. You know, when I was a preacher's kid, we moved nine times. I moved in nine different schools before I was a freshman in high school, God. I did not want to do that to my kids. At the time, I only had Vanessa and Kaylee, and I just didn't want to put them through that nine different schools. God, come on. I'm, not going to, I'm just not going to do that. God's going, I'm just, I just need you to do one thing for me, Vince. You can look at your surroundings, and you can look at all the different people, but I just need you to surrender, and I'll take care of that for you. But see, I didn't listen. I kept putting it off. Well, God, God, if I if I'm if I'm if I if I say yes to preaching, then, then man, my dad's gonna want me to preach like him. And I don't know if I want to preach like my dad. He's a pretty good preacher, but I, I'm, I may be different. Nobody's gonna like it if I'm different. So I'm just not gonna do that. And I kept saying no, and I kept saying no, and I kept saying no. In fact, when I finally did, there were still more things that kept telling me no. And it was funny because I kept saying, Jennifer doesn't want to be a preacher's wife. And then I kept adding things to that. I kept saying, you know, God, she doesn't play the piano. <laughs> I'm not sure if she knows how to make fried chicken. <laughs> and if you grew up in church, you know that those are two pretty non-negotiables that a preacher's wife needs to have. And seriously, I would have these conversations with God, blaming everything on my surroundings. So after a year, a year of fighting that, I'll tell you, we, we went to church one time, me and Jennifer did, and it was the first sermon I'd ever got to preach away from my home church. A church called me and said, hey, our pastors left. And uh, we'd like you to come preach. And my first question was, why'd he leave? <laughs> <laughs> and do I want to come? And I said, yeah, I'll preach. I'll preach. You bet. You want me to preach? I'll come preach. They were like, fantastic. I said, it'll be me and my wife, my two little girls that are coming. Oh, that's fantastic. We get there. And before the service started, five different people asked Jennifer to play the piano. I kid you not, I can take you to the church. I won't tell you where it's at, but I can take you there if you ever want to know. So they said, hey, Miss Daniel, we'd love to see you play. Could you help us out by playing the piano this morning? She said, no, I don't play. I don't play. And they were like, oh, okay. She'd get, hey, good morning. Hey, Miss Daniel, we're so excited that you're here. Would you like to play the piano for us? It went on like that the whole time people were welcoming us there. Then the service starts. Deacon stands up. We'd sure so honored to have Pastor Vince here and his lovely wife. And, and I'm just going to go ahead and, Miss Jennifer, why don't you come up today and lead us at the piano in our worship singing this morning? After the fact, I said, you should have just went. Thank you. That's what I, I said. You should have just done that. It would have been awesome. Nobody would ever ask you again. And see, I mean, it was like the devil was going, see, see. You don't have all the right stuff. You can't do this. I mean, she doesn't play the piano. It ends up being a great thing. We laugh about it constantly, about her playing the piano. And it, it never fails. If you go into a traditional church, that's the first thing. Do you play the piano? And she's like, 
amazingly. I'm just not playing for you. No, she doesn't say that. <laughs> I wish she would, though. That would be awesome. Um, <clears throat> The devil is going to constantly remind you of what you don't have. I'm sure whispering in Mary's ear was, Mary, you're 15 years old. Do you know what they're going to say about you if you end up pregnant? I mean, culture is different now than it was then. I mean, having a red letter day now is different than having a red letter day then. They would have marked her. Carry that around with you at 15, carrying the Son of God, trying to explain it to your husband or your, uh, your fiancé because he, he hadn't got the message yet. Honey, um, this is going to sound strange, but I'm pregnant, and it's not yours but it's God's. He'd have been like, I don't care what you call him, this is over. <laughs> See, Joseph, the Bible says he was a good man. He was a good man and not willing, not willing to put her to open shame. And so he's stuck. So her circumstances, the devil's going, hey, 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 you can't do this. You can't do this. And, but her surrender is what got her to the next place. And then the angel came to Joseph and said, hey, this is legit. Joseph, stick by her. You be the man that God's called you to be, and this is going to work out okay. And so he did that. And so people in your life, you need to understand that your surroundings, as crazy and as chaotic as they may be, and the world's telling you just can't do it. The Bible tells me for nothing is impossible with God. But Vince, this addiction has got me. No, 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 no. Stop looking at where you are and start looking at where you want to be and trust God for the outcome. See, we got to keep believing that God is true in what he says. How many of you believe God is honest? Say amen. amen. Then stop telling yourself that you can't. Because the word of God says something very different. That's the paradox. The paradox is we begin to believe the voices that we hear saying, well, I'm never going to lose weight. I'm never going to find the right man, Vince. I just can't find the right man. Quit looking. Especially quit looking in some of the places you've been looking. Vince, I'm never going to find a woman that will love me. Then change some things. Take a shower. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's a huge plus. Women like people that smell good. Can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. Okay. Maybe it's not just a shower. Maybe there are other things. But if you keep focusing on the surroundings and the situation, you're not ever going to see the end result. You won't see it. I was telling somebody after the first service, he's like, Vince, he said, I constantly, I, I, I get right with God, and it seems like I just kind of veer off. Anybody live that life? Okay, here's the deal. Here's the thing, and it's so simple. It's so simple, but yet I struggle with it too. The, God's, the Bible says that God's way is straight and narrow. Straight and narrow, and few there are that walk on it. But see, the thing about a straight and narrow path is you've got to watch where you're going. If you don't watch where you're going, and the moment you look off, you veer. You've got to stay focused on the goal. And if you are constantly looking down into your circumstances and your surrounding and not surrendering to what God could have happened in your life, you're going to be off track. Your relationships are going to be off point. Your jobs are going to be off point because you lost focus. And so you say, God, okay, get me back where I need to be. Take away the surroundings. But here's the thing. I don't want you to forget the surroundings. Because that leads us to our second thing. It says this in Hebrews. Let me, let me give you the point first. It says, learn, learn. You need to learn something where you are right now that will get you to where you're going. And see, now, when I was growing up and going to nine different schools, I was like, God, I don't like this. this is, I have to make new friends every stinking year. I, don't, I, I, didn't, I, was, I wasn't really that much of an extrovert when I started school. I've got a fifth grade picture that would just blow your hair back. It's an amazing school picture. It may be the worst school picture I've ever seen. And if God allows, I may show it to you one of these days after I die. <laughs> but I thought, God, I, I hate this. But you know, now I look back and go, God, you taught me in those years of my life that, man, I can talk to anybody. 
I can talk. I don't, I don't even care if they like me or not. I'll talk to them. And, and I mean, I even know that they don't like me. And if I find out they don't like me, I still don't mind talking to them. How are you? What's up? What's going on? It really drives them crazy if they don't like me, but I don't mind talking. <coughs> Jennifer, I can't go to grocery shopping with my wife anymore because people stop me in every aisle. It takes us like three and a half hours because people are like, hey, I'm like, hey, because I can't help myself. I just love to talk. And, and, and had I not lived in this environment, had God not been showing me something in my circumstance that would help me over here in his purpose, I'd have missed it. And so many times, here's the thing. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 5, that although he was a son, this is talking about Jesus, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he, what's it say? Oh, but Vince, my life is horrible right now. What are you learning? Because it's one thing to learn where you're at, but the reality is most of us complain. My job sucks. What are you learning to get you to a new one? My job, my marriage is awful, Vince. What are you learning that's going to take it from here to here? I'm learning she doesn't like it when I leave my dirty clothes laying around, then pick them up. <laughs> Marriage is so complicated. No, it's not. <laughs> Just got to think a little bit. We'll spend some more time there next February, okay? But you've got to be able to take where God has had you in places and said, you know, what are you going to learn while I got you here? There was a moment after I graduated high school. I graduated in May, and then in August, I got off an airplane in Los Angeles, California by myself and, and started in this ministry. The first trip they sent me out on, I was excited. I'm like, this is going to be amazing. We're going to get to share the gospel across the country, and it's fantastic. Well, the first night, we didn't have any money at all. And so I got to sleep in the basement of a Salvation Army next to a guy that stared at me all night long, <laughs> like this, just creepy. Now, I sat there, and I held all my stuff. I, I didn't put anything under my cot. I held all my bags in my bunk with me and stared back at him, because <laughs> I'm not going to sleep here. We were down in San Antonio coming across country. I had to be in Virginia Beach from Los Angeles, California in about two and a half days. It's a pretty good drive. And I thought, man, God, if you would just, this was before cell phones. I couldn't just call dad or call mom or call anybody. Like, I, I don't want to do this. God, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I quit. I'm out. I'll just do something else. I'll go back home. I'll do something else. And God's going, no, 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 I need you to learn something here, Vince. I need you to learn something in these moments that aren't comfortable. They're not going to be comfortable. It's life. You know, no, the whole thing is life is a bed of roses and stuff. That you, how many of you know that's a lie straight from the pit of hell? Yeah. It's not. Jesus even said, he said, there will be sorrow. You know, there, there's enough evil for tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself is what he tells us there in Matthew. So I, I said, God, but did, no, I'm a Christian, man. I'm supposed to wake up and like eat clouds for breakfast and see unicorns and stuff. It's supposed to be awesome. And he smacks me around a little bit and says, what Bible did you read? <laughs> and he says, no, 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 the Vince, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into these trials and these temptations. Oh, God. You mean I got to learn obedience? Put that verse back up there from Hebrews. I, 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 need, I need to learn obedience through suffering and trials. It's where we learn to say Yes where we learn to say, God, I believe in what you're saying, and I'm going to go that direction. And it's a paradox because we don't want suffering. We don't want to learn from suffering. We want somebody to just put it on a platter for us. That's not learning. You know the reason you don't hit yourself on the thumb anymore with a hammer is because you did it once. That's the reason. There, I, we, me and a friend of mine, I don't know if Tubbs is here in this service, but when we were over to the other church, he shot me with an air nailer right in the side of the hand. He didn't mean to. It was just a finished nailer. It wasn't like a big 16 penny. If that was story, it would have been a lot cooler. But um, it was just a small finished nailer, and he shot it, it hit a knot, and it come out of the board, and it, bam, stuck right in my hand. Guess what? Now if I use a finished nailer, I don't put my hand anywhere near where it's going to come out. I learned a great lesson. 
We learn lessons through our suffering and our trials in life. But God is saying, you know what? Make sure you're learning something while you're there to get you to where you need to be. But Vince, it's uncomfortable out there. God is trying to stretch me. This over here feels like home. Well, if your home is broken, why would you stay? When God has a mansion over here for you, you say, well, I, Vince, I've never lived in a mansion before. It's because you've never surrendered to God what he has for you in your life. Because, see, God never, 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 you read in Scripture, God has never wanted less for you. That's not biblical. God said he wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or even ask for. That's what God, God said, I didn't make you just an overcomer. I made you more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus the Lord. And so you have this ability to live here in the presence and the power and the purpose of God, but you've got to step out of the current situation and surrounding. You say, Vince, what does any of this have to do with Christmas? If Mary would have said no, Been a lot different at the nativity scene, wouldn't it? Now, Jesus, God would have found a way because he's God and his plan will get done. But he had found a way. But I'm so thankful someone said yes. And it took a teenager to, to guide the past. Students, teens, don't think you're uh, uh, of, of no concern. You guys started this. John, in the New Testament, the guy that wrote the book of John, he was a teenager when he started walking with Jesus, hanging out with Jesus, probably somewhere between the ages of 15 and 17 years old. And he got to hang out with Jesus for three and a half years of ministry. And I'm sure he was full teenager. He was the one cutting jokes and making weird noises by the fire at night. But I'm sure. <laughs> what an amazing opportunity to be there with Jesus. So don't think you have no importance. See, that's, that's the third thing. Not only do you have to surrender regardless of your surroundings. And not only do you have to learn where you are so that you can get where you need to go, but you've got to discover and understand that God's purpose is always bigger than mine and your perspective. Do you realize that everything that happened to you this week was to get you here today? No, nah, Vince, it can't be that simple. I wouldn't say that's simple. There's 200 plus people in here, and God orchestrated it all, so we get to hang out together at 11 o'clock in a horse barn. Isn't he good that way? See, he started orchestrating this back when I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, saying, no, God, no, God, no, God, I'm not going, God, I'm not going to preach, God, and finally I broke and said, God, I'll preach, it's five, get off my back! I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, I know me and Jennifer are doing children's church for you, and I know it's time for us to, you know... We've been helping out, but I just have to go. I have to leave and go back to Arkansas. God's calling me to preach. And he went, oh, thank you. Jeez, will you please go? I said, what? He said, please, please go. He said, because you saying no is not only making you miserable, but it's making everybody around you miserable. So please go. Do what God is asking you to do. How many of you know and realize that some of the no's you are giving to God are affecting the people around you? God is saying, pray with your wife, and you're going, I'm not doing that, and it's affecting not only you, but it's affecting your wife and your children. God is telling you to go into that job and work as if it's unto the Lord. And you go, I'm not doing that, God, I hate my boss. And so you're miserable there, and your boss is miserable there, and your family is miserable when you get home. See, God's purpose is so much bigger than mine and your perspective. You and I see this moment, and God sees the eternity of time going, if you'll just step where I tell you to step, it's about to get awesome. It's about to hit a plane and a level that you've never thought possible. But you're going to have to leave the paradox of what has always been and believe something can be greater. You're going to have to stop taking what God says is truth and, and flipping it upside down and saying, well, it just doesn't apply to me. Sure, God may be able to do impossible stuff, but that's for somebody else. That's not for me. 
how selfish of you to think God would promise something to everybody else on the planet, but not you? Come on. That's not how he works. He says, I have a plan for you, and it's a good plan. It's a perfect plan, and it is to give you hope, and it is to give you an expected end, and it is not for evil. That's what the God of creation wants for you. So you're sitting here, and you say, Vince, so what do I do? What, what is it that I do? Well, maybe you've got to stop blaming everybody else for a little bit. See, I blame Jennifer for not preaching. I blame my kids. Seriously. They were two and a half and six months old. God, my kids aren't going to want to be preacher's kids. They couldn't feed themselves, and I was blaming them. You stop blaming your job and say, God, what do you want to show me? What do you want to show me so that I can end up where you want me to be? So that I can end up living in this plan and walking this path and living with this purpose that you have for me? What do you need to show me today? What do I need to repent of so that I start fresh? Maybe you're saying, God, I, I need to learn. I hate, I hate where I am right now. What do I need to learn what do I need to learn today that'll push me one step further, one step closer to you?